from Rochester, New York, this is Mad Dog Movies, Episode 2. We now join a conversation between filmmakers Mike Boas and John Vincent, already in progress. Yeah, I've known you, I don't know, five, six years. and uh, Which is too long. Yeah, really. You were pro-film for a very long time. I still am pro-film. But this camera sort of won you over? Is that Well, it, it's a matter of being able to do something and not being able to do something. Right. What's the best tool? The be- best, best tool. If, the budget, if, yeah. the, if I had the budget, yeah. I would shoot film. Now, one of my favorite formats is Super 16. Right. Uh, for a number of reasons. Which, I mean, it looks great. You get the uh, Vision and it, 2 stock. Right. And and, I mean, compared, uh, Super 16 compared to the HVX, I mean, Super 16 is still going to, it's going to blow it out of the water in terms of, you know, when you're shooting at night, picking up details mm-hmm. in the shadows, uh, the latitude, um, which is basically a simplified version of what latitude is, is the details that show up within a given brightness of the, or darkness of the film. You're able to see more detail within the same exposures, yeah. within the same lighting conditions. Yeah, in video you have a narrower window, basically. Yeah, so it's a little trickier. You have to. It's a lot harder to light for HD to get it to come close to looking like film, and it mm-hmm. still doesn't look like film. But it's you know it really but, is I mean, in the light. If you're shooting a no budget, which is essentially what we're doing here, mm-hmm. you know, our film like Midnight is a, is you know basically a no budget. Nobody's really getting paid to work on it. I mean, I'm. The I've difference been, between other no-budget movies and ours, so hopefully, is we got professional people that know. We have professional because of my contacts, because yeah. of you, because of me, because other people that work for me. Because I, you know, I, I've been working in the business for ages, and I have people, my crew and stuff. We work on you know big, you know fairly large size professional films, and we're going to do this film ourselves and not yeah. take any money for it right off the bat. So we want we just be, and we're doing that because we want to start calling our shots and making our own projects. Right. And, and bringing these old style effects into into these movies, and we figure if we make them for a certain a certain budget, mm-hmm. that uh, we'd be able to at least you know make a living at it. You know, I mean, I do believe there's a market out there for uh, seeing a, a Lovecraft type of story that oh, yeah. has some really cool creature effects, a good story. Yep. You know, a little TNA, of course, and a little humor because uh, a little humor. I know writing with you is interesting because. Uh, I, I start out with one idea that it's going to be this serious, scary movie, and you come in with, oh, well, let's put in some jokes here. And I'm like, well, well they're it, not it, jokes. Yeah, so that's much. the thing. It's not exactly. It's not because life. It's, I, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it, it, life. I agree. It's not a comedy. I understand. And it's not a drama. Yeah. It is is somewhere in between. It's a mixture yeah. of comedy and drama. I mean, real life is. I mean, you know, you know, it's like my own life. I've had all this tragedy, right? And then, yeah. you know, my. You know, my father passing away was it was probably laugh. the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. You know, but as my father was dying, we were making jokes about it. I mean, I, you know, I mean, just yeah. as an example, I mean, we knew my father was going to pass away. Uh, we had a good idea he was going to pass away, and we mm-hmm. pull out of the driveway. I'm driving. I stop. I pull them, get the mail out of the mailbox, and I said, "Hey, Dad, look, you want to." Thousand bucks a week for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, I, you know, but that's. And how do you take that? He laughed. Yeah, yeah, sure, you know, you I mean, it. but what are you going to do? You know, so, I, you know. So within I this just movie, think within the, we've, the we've got art, not my jokes, art, but you know, I, I humor. think it's. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. You can't have one or the I just don't think you can have one without the other. Yeah, well. <laughs> You read Lovecraft, and it's all dirge and stern. Well, and I know. I, I, but you know, that's this, okay. This we're doing is, our own yeah, thing. Yeah, we, we're doing our own thing based on the Lovecraft mythos with our own yeah. – inject, certainly injecting our own take on it because it isn't as, as dark and it isn't quite as depressing yep. as uh, some of the – which some people might not like, but hey. Well, <laughs> you always have this problem – you have a problem in, in almost every horror movie. you got a character put into an extreme situation – Maybe there's like a leap of, of belief that they have to go through. And how do you address that without, you know, you know, let's say someone doesn't believe in ghosts or they don't believe in vampires. Which I don't. I don't believe in any right. of that stuff. So you imagine, well, how is someone going to, okay, then you got a vampire in the movie. Yeah. You got a vampire that they come across. How do they react to it? How do they make the, make the jump from their rational life to this, okay, now we're in a vampire world. I think from Dusk Till Dawn, you have this scene in the movie where everyone says, I don't believe in vampires. But well, that 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 I, that wasn't right. And well, they, I had a, I have a funny have, story. They about have to that. joke about it, and it, it sort of breaks the ice. And, and 
it's a little bit of winking to the audience to let them well, in. Well, we went to see that. My my cousin, two of my cousins and I went and saw right. that film. Yeah. Uh, my one cousin and I knew the film was a horror film. My other cousin... Because it's in the commercials. Well, my other cousin didn't see any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. He was going to the film, and it starts out as this crime <laughs> thing, like a Pulp Fiction-ish <laughs> type of exactly film. exactly what they wanted. And so we're sitting there watching the film, and then all of a sudden... Uh, you know, uh, Selma Hayek turns into this demon right. vampire. Right. And my cousin, my one cousin's like, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> and I get to the movie, says, "What? I had no idea." So you know, it's like all, I'm thinking I'm watching one movie, all of a sudden it turns into something else. Well, then, did he go along with it, or was he like, "I'm walking out"? Yeah, well, he didn't know what to make of it. Yeah. He didn't walk out. No, I mean, you know, we had a good time. I mean, like I said, uh, the two of us knew what was yeah. going to go on, you know, but he, but that was made it even funnier. But that was the sort of rub your hands together glee that like Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez had when they probably came up with, you know, let's do this. And hey, we won't tell anyone. It's like Psycho killing off a character halfway through. Like oh, people won't expect it. It'll be great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it almost, it, I mean, it's a cult It's a cult favorite now, but I don't think it really did well in the box office because a lot of film, it mean, is, you know, it, the people want to pigeonhole things. And then if they if they don't fall right into one category, they don't know how to market it. And that, that's a, Yeah, that's well, a, the, you're talking to the distribution companies and the, and the yeah. larger and the people to put the films out mm-hmm. yeah a long time ago films had and I could say a long time ago but we're <laughs> talking in the, in the, talking in the 70s and into the 80s okay, yeah. films were at the theater much longer for quite yeah. some time and it took a long time to catch on uh, I'm trying to think of some of the films that uh, that didn't catch on right away and they uh, were, I'll give you one uh, Bonnie and Clyde Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde, boy, it, it was tanking, and they took it around from city to city to city to city. This is like 67. Uh, and it, it actually, you yeah, know, that was one of those weird Arthur success Penn, stories. Arthur Penn, right? Arthur Ar- Penn, yep, yeah. Yep. And then it ended up winning, did it win some Academy Awards for the actors? Or, I don't know. It, it may It certainly have. got a lot of acclaim once once people realized The how, editing how nice on that, one of the things that struck out, uh, stuck out for me was all the editing yeah. on that film. And, you know... Uh, uh, very peck and fire, very peck and pie ish, because definitely influenced by peck and pie. But I yeah, think so. but that's what happened. You know, films were made. Uh, you would uh, find a distributor. Yeah, well, it's a different would get world. Get into now. the theaters. I mean, Night of the Living Dead. Right, that's you know, one that is, is, is one of the classics. They that, finish the movie. They they go to take it to the distributor, and it was like same week or same day, even that uh, Martin Luther King was shot, and no one wanted to look at a horror movie like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was 68, and then it wasn't until, like, 71 that yeah. it really started being successful through an alternative stream. Uh, it wasn't right. it wasn't mainstream. It was through Midnight Movies, which doesn't exist anymore. But that was that right. was a weird sort but, of tenure. But there was these venues time. like Midnight Movies to for these films yeah. to, you know, the harder they fall and right. or, uh, harder, no, they the, harder they come. Harder they come. Harder they come. And uh, Eraserhead. Eraserhead was uh, certainly one of them, and Pink Flamingos, and and that was a you know it's a fun idea to hey let's do midnight movies again. Rocky but Horror, which I can never get my head yeah. around. Rocky Horror, <laughs> you gotta be, you gotta be. Uh, I don't know. It depends on who you're with. I was with a, a, a girl. She's a very nice girl. <laughs> very, very cute. And the <laughs> only reason I went to saw that movie is because she was one of the ones that was acting like one of the people on the screen. Oh, really? So she was a nice girl during the day. And she dressed up. I forgot the name. The one with the top hat. She would dress right. up. Right. Like, it was either uh, Columbia or Magenta. I was going to uh, two I have no idea. Yeah. But anyway, so that's the only reason I went. And she runs, everybody's running through the audience and yeah. doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm like, why am I here? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know. But when she sat on my lap at the, you know, and it was worth it. <laughs> but... What I'm saying is that was a really like subversive, like counterculture way to see a movie and yeah. way to distribute a movie, and uh, it was like instead of distributing a movie, you're planning sort of a rock show. It's like almost like touring right. a band. It's or, not about the movie at that point. Yeah, it's about the experience. Yeah, and that sort of thing is you know, because of the conglomerates and the the models out there right now, you can't really do it. I mean, you can bring a you can. Go around to film festivals. That is, an, you know, that that is that is a problem. You know, a distribution yeah. for independent films is a major issue. And there is the Landmark Theater chain, which is uh, run by Mark Cuban, and he also has the Magnolia Pictures and HD Net, which is sort of a three prong approach to getting a movie out there. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Steven Soderbergh, for instance, had Bubble, and there's a couple other movies that would go on HDNet and go to the landmark theaters and maybe DVD all in the same week. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of, hey, why not have just one promotion campaign? And no matter how you can get to see the movie is how you get to see the movie. Um, it's, you know, of course, you got to have someone behind you to sort of help that go through. For us, for, uh, you know, uh, someone doing something low budget, you know, direct a video might be your best option. Or, you know, if you can get someone like Lionsgate to pick you up, you really kind of need, you need a distributor and a major, like, mm-hmm. infrastructure to actually get onto theater screens. Yeah, and, I mean, theater screens isn't necessarily the, you know, venue for mm-hmm. a lot of the films. Like, what we're doing, the chances of making to a movie screen are, yeah. you know, pretty thin. Well, even something like Feast or the movies that went under the After Dark label, which yeah. were then piggybacked through uh, Lionsgate, um, it was just like, you know, a one or two week engagement and then right. it's done. They didn't want to. And a lot of times yeah. and now they're releasing DVDs at the same time yeah. that they release in the theater as a marketing thing. Just maybe yeah. to get a little interest at the theater. Mm-hmm. Boom. You go and buy the DVD. But I think DVDs uh, and up, uh, is probably the, the best venue uh, of finding a distribution uh, just you know through that and through television, uh, pay-per-view. And the Internet, I think, is an up-and-coming uh uh, and people, it's weird because people are doing stuff on cell phones now too. Yeah, there's content created just to watch on cell phones. Yeah, that's well, that's I keep hearing about that over the last several years. I don't know if it's really taken off or not. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's I read, like, I, I kind of read, I, I keep up on these manuals, these HD video yeah. and and other things, and I I like reading articles about my the camera. The again, the HVX 200, that camera is being used for a lot of that type of stuff. Sure, you know, and uh, it's all HD. You know, if you can get money out of it, then that's, then then people will chase the money. Um, there's also, I mean, you can distribute through YouTube and podcasting and that sort of thing. There's not much money in that yet. Yeah. Um, it's it's more of an advertising thing. You get a sponsor maybe, and and you get your money from the sponsor instead of the end consumer. Yeah, the big thing is to create something that people are going to want to watch. Yeah. And if you create something that people are going to want to watch, mm-hmm. there you're gonna you're, you'll find a place to to put it. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, that's a key thing. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, what we're doing. I mean, it's in the horror genre. Yep. There is a whole subculture of Lovecraft people, which has a kind of a, a built-in yeah. audience, uh, keeping the budget to a very small amount. These are the things you have to think about ahead of time without being too, you know, you're not uh, selling out to think about the end market. It's, it, well, you know, no, you have to. You, you, you can't have, just go at it. Yeah. As, I'm an artist, and whatever I do is right. No, I mean, it, I mean, I mean, yeah, this cliche has been used so many times, but it's called show business, not show a show. Mm-hmm. That you, ha- in order for you to make projects, you have to make money. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a balance between the two. I mean, there's very few people that are able just to make their. I mean, we're not living in Europe. Yeah, I mean, we're not the Quay Brothers. <laughs> for those of you who don't know who the Quay Brothers are, look them up on the internet. <laughs> but they're Americans that went to uh, um, United Kingdom okay. to do their art because a lot of that stuff is funded by the government through right. grants. And, right. and we don't have that here. Yeah, you've you know? got some of that in Canada and New Zealand. Yeah. But, yeah, it's hard to, hard to do that here. Uh, yeah, it is. It's very difficult. It is, you know, I mean, this is capitalism at its finest. Yeah. And, and you are creating a product that you want people to see so they'll pay yeah. They'll give you money yeah. for what you've done, and you take that money and you go make more product. And just to clarify, it's not like we said, "Hey, look, here's an audience for Lovecraft films. Let's make one for them." It, it was more like, I mean, I already yeah, we like we like I, the I was stuff. Re- I was reading, you know? I was reading the stuff, and through my research, because I wanted to do my own short film uh, a few years ago, I wanted to I wanted to do my own Lovecraft piece. And I was reading through what other people had done, and I found out that's where I sort of found the niche. Uh-huh. I'm like, wow, this you know these are people that are you know interested in more product already. I'm I'm interested in the subject matter, so why not do something that they would you know enjoy? Yeah. I was never someone who was into the uh, mad slasher movies so much. Right. As uh, you know, as much as I always liked the very creative, story-oriented, yeah. creature-oriented type of, of films. My, me too. I mean, I prefer monster or supernatural, um, you know, sci-fi stuff over you know hack and slash. Yeah, Although I do have uh, a know. certain place in my heart for uh, the Friday Thirteenth movies and 
and you know the first Halloween and the first, the first Nightmare. Yeah, on yeah, Elm the Street. first Halloween. But if you, I mean, if you look at some of those films, they were not as as violent and, and, and gory yeah. as people think. Or, you know, remember them but, as being. I mean, Halloween. I can't yeah. remember her you know, any any uh, <laughs> much of anything other than strangling. You know, and there are things like that. But yeah, there not, really not was a lot a, of groove. Even but the te- people, Texas yeah. Chainsaw Massacre. Right. You never really saw. You thought you saw. But, stuff. Be, the, but see the filmmaking in that. The filmmaking, the editing, and yeah. the, the choice of what you see is actually more intense it's, than just. It's not a. If you just had a proscenium, hey, right. look, I'm going to cut out my guts. You know. Well, a lot of people like to go see the gore, yeah. which is fine. I mean, yeah. I just that's not my thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've I've done it. I've done it in movies. You know, I've worked on films where I've actually had to create that gore. <laughs> you know, which is it's easy. Yeah, uh, it's not really that difficult. This is funny <laughs> because I've you know. The, the pages of the script that you wrote, or you're like, here, check this out, and and now we've got characters getting cut up into pieces. Yeah, but but it's, but, but, but that's it's, the story's not about that. No, you're it's, not. That's you know, true. you know. I mean, it, I have nothing against putting that in, in films and seeing that. Yeah. I mean, I love George Romero's films. Yeah, yeah. You know, but it was it wasn't like you know, at least it wasn't for me. It wasn't like, oh, I can't wait for the next yeah. scene for someone to get ripped up. I, George I, I, must <laughs> get tired of. I mean, you know, his his base level of fans, maybe even the young, you know, the youngest, maybe teenagers, they love, you know, the, hey, you know, I love the, when a guy was chewing on the guts, or I love this and all that. He's like, uh huh, uh huh. But that's not the reason he made the movie. That's he's not got, the reason he made the he's movie. He's got social commentary going on in most of well, those movies. Well, these are all movies. tools. Yeah, they're all t- tools used yeah. to. You know, tell his story. I mean, you could have just an amusement park ride of a movie, and it'd be a totally fun experience. But it's nice if if you have something that's there for the second time you watch it too. Right. That about does it for another episode of Mad Dog Movies. If you'd like to visit us on the interweb, go to maddogmovies.com/podcast. Email us at feedback at maddogmovies.com. And if you'd like to take a look at our website, uh, philrosefilms.com, you'll be able to see a lot of the visual effects we've done in the past, some of the art department stuff we've done on features, and find out the latest news about films we're working on, like Lake Midnight and other projects. That's philrosefilms, P-H-I-L-R-O-S-E films.com. Music for this episode provided by Keith Handy. Visit him at keithhandy.com. Mad Dog Movies was taped before a live studio audience.